Hi there, welcome back to another session here of uh, some words out of the Bible. Um, I'm nursing an awful cold here, so bear with me. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about churches, why people go and why people don't go. And you're going to fit into one of these categories, as do I. But I was rather fascinated to do this study, and I learned a lot from doing this study, uh, because sometimes I go into a church, I do that for observation purposes, because I write books, and I like to know what's going on in the pulpit, what they're preaching, uh, and I like to compare. And then you see these mega churches like uh, Saddleback out in California, run by Rick Warren, or this Joel Austin guy from uh, Houston, Texas. And there were others, Bill Hybels from Illinois. I'll get into that in just a minute. But when you see these people, and I have witnessed um, seeing and hearing Bill Hybels in person at a local church, uh, but, I, but you have to wonder, there are so many different churches. Forget about religion. I'm not even going to talk about religion today. I'm just going to be talking about churches and the size of churches. Which one should we belong to? A small one? A medium one? A large one? A denominational one? A non-denominational one? What should we do? We're only human. How, do we, how are we supposed to figure out what to do? Well, uh, coincidentally, as I usually say, the Bible has the answers to everything. And uh, I'm astounded at some of the things I hear on TV, even from some preachers in these mega churches. It just... It's, uh, I can't even, I can't even find the words to describe how I feel. Sometimes I want to pick up a cup and toss it right through the screen. Sometimes, like today, I was practicing, so I listened to uh, TBN. Now, I, I watch TBN a lot because there's a lot of good preachers up there. But there was this one guy up there, they're raising money, obviously, for the network, but he was preaching about Jesus walking through the streets of Jerusalem and old Zacchaeus, uh, a tax collector, was up in the tree. Now the whole message of the story really was that Jesus was going to go and speak to Zacchaeus in his house. And the congregation from the local temple there came around and said, why are you going to talk to sinners like this tax collector who's ripping us off royally? But the preacher on TV twisted the whole thing around to say, and then, when Jesus said, and then salvation came to Zacchaeus. And he twisted it around to say, you know when Jesus said, and now uh, salvation has come to Zacchaeus, was when Zacchaeus said to Jesus, I'm going to give back 50% of everything that I own to the uh, people here. That, and, and if anybody... If I robbed anybody or overcharged them, I'll give them back four times uh, the money that I took from them. So Jesus says, and salvation has come to Zacchaeus. <clears throat> so that preacher was, in my opinion, twisted that whole reason that Jesus is one who says, I talk to sinners. That's, who, that's why I'm here. I came to save the lost. The lost are sinners twisted that around to say that Jesus really meant that Zacchaeus found salvation because he separated his thinking from his money. In other words, you people in the congregation out here, you're thinking about your money. Well, I'm thinking, I want you to not think about your money. Jesus was saying to Zacchaeus, don't think about your money. Instead, separate your thinking from your money. That's what's good. That's what brings salvation. So the whole ploy, the whole twisted sermon was to get people softened up so that when it came time to take pledges and all that stuff for these giant mega churches, um, that they would, the people are going to say, eh, you know, the guy got to me, uh, yeah, I'm going to shell on a little more than I normally would have. So that type of stuff is where I want to throw my coffee cup right through the screen. But I digress. Now, let me start first with why people do not go to churches. And they're valid, I mean, pretty valid reasons. 
valid or not, these are the reasons that you, if you don't go to church, or some others, uh, use. Well, one reason, not even listed here, I'm thinking about uh, a chat I have with somebody on YouTube, was that they don't have a church in their local town. I'm thinking, you got to have a town somewhere else. I've driven 30 minutes to go to church. I've driven 50 minutes to go to church. Nonetheless, I'm not finding fault, not blaming you, because that's one of the reasons people don't go to church. Let me uh, talk about that. What number, reason number one why people do not go to church. Because church people are both judgmental and negative. I can see their point. If you go to some churches or talk to some Christians, they, they walk around like a Pharisee. Hey, you're, you're a sinner. You know, hey, you didn't tithe last week. Hey, you didn't do this, that, and the other thing like I do. Uh, so they're being judgmental and negative. Um, everything they talk about, it seems like they, there's no happy Christians out there. They're all negative. Let me move to number two. Church is boring. This is why mega churches are coming into fruition uh, right now. But church is boring. Why? Because you show up like most churches, small or medium-sized churches. You go there, there's maybe a choir up front or some guy playing a piano. You will sit there, you will sing four songs, and then they may take an offering, and then the preacher stands up and gives his little message, and then they'll sing another song, then they'll give a uh, doxology or a benediction or, you know, the closing out the service prayer. And then I'll see you later, folks. Go home. Hey, it is boring. So mega churches have learned, wait, people don't want to be bored. They want to be the opposite of bored, which is entertained. Therefore, the piano is gone. Uh, the choirs are basically gone. And instead, now there's a band or a group of, you know, usually younger kids playing guitars and drums and all kinds of stuff and singing praises to the Lord and raising their hands. Nothing wrong with that, don't get me wrong. Uh, what has replaced the organs and what has replaced the cross at the front of the church is now a couple of jumbotrons, you know, these big mega screens like I've got here. But you know, I actually dig that, so I, I don't find anything wrong with that yet. But let me get to reason number three why people don't go to church. The church is very exclusive. In other words, if you don't believe what I believe, we don't want you here. And they're, they, they're a clique. You know, my four and no more. What? You don't believe the same way we do? And you can't get ten of them in a church like that to believe the same thing. They'll all argue about whatever they think the scripture says, right? So that's the third reason. Uh, the fourth reason is that the church is homophobic. You know, the church is anti-gay. They hate gay people. They don't like the, uh, the uh, fact that uh, men are marrying men and women are ma marrying women. I'm not going to touch upon that subject right now. I'm just giving you the reasons why people don't go to church. Now, 20 years ago, these people, same people would never have said that, by the way. They would have said, yeah, that's right, church and uh, homos, homosexuals. Uh, they don't mix, so you can't have it. Now there are some churches that really actually cater to exclusively, talk about exclusivity, homosexuals, uh, lesbianism, so forth and so on. Number five, the reason that people don't go to church is this. I, and I've heard this from even my brothers and my kids sometimes. And I agree with them. I hate organized religion. Ever hear that one? That means... An organized religion has a hierarchy from, you know, wherever it is. Then the big guy there, or the woman in charge, whatever, usually it's a guy. <clears throat> and he's the power source. He, whatever he says, he's the dictator in that church. I don't blame him. Number six, reasons that, <laughs> reasons that people do not go to church are the church is full of hypocrites. Well, look at, let's be realistic. The world is full of hypocrites. Hypocrites means you say one thing and do another. I'm a hypocrite. I fall into that category. So will you, if you're honest. You'll say this to somebody. You'll lie to that person to make sure that, you know, that you, they don't look unfavorably upon you. So, yeah, we're all hypocrites. So the church is full of hypocrites. Absolutely right. I agree with it 100%. It is. 
because they're full of people, and people are, generally speaking, hypocrites. Uh, number seven, the church just wants my money. Well, if you listen to TV, church, sometimes, what you will hear, or what you will see if you go to local churches, small, medium, or large, makes no difference, except I think Joel Osteen does not uh, ask for money in church because he's smart. And there's a local church that doesn't, and they always meet their budget. I'm not saying Joe Lostein is cool. I'm just saying he's the only one I know of that doesn't ask for money. Everyone else is out there busting your chops for the money. And how do they do it? <coughs> they cough. And they want you to cough too. Cough up your money. What? You're robbing God of the tithes? God says he wants 10%. Don't you want to do what God says? So, you know, and I've said this before, I believe that that's true. Uh, I'm not saying the church wants their money. I'm saying the church must have their money in order to function and pay salaries. And if they don't get enough take one week, they're going to be short. So they don't want to, you know, cheat somebody out of some payroll next week. So the church just wants my money. I can see where people say that, but it's not necessarily true that they want it, that they need it. But they preach tithing, which as most of you know, I say, and that Bible says in Hebrews uh, 3, I think it's Hebrews 7, 5 or 3, 5, where the Levite priests are the ones, the only ones, that must take a tithe from their people, their Jewish brethren. And there's nothing in the New Testament about tithing. There's a reason for giving that's found in Luke 16, 9, where Jesus points out through Scripture that the, and if people just got this, they'd love to give. Not only enough the tithe to take care of the church, which is a necessity, but not a mandate, mind you, but they want to give their money. And the reason in Luke 16, 9 is to go and win souls for the kingdom of heaven. That's reasonable to ask for that, and that's, I mean, what's a soul worth these days? What's your son or your daughter's soul worth? Would you like to see them going into the lake of fire, or would you rather see them going into heaven? You get it? But I won't go down that track today, because I just want to point out why people do go, and why some do not go to church. Uh, number eight, my life is just fine without religion. And that's true. People go to work, they come home, they watch sports on Sunday. Life is pretty good. They go to the beach, they take vacations. What do they need? Religion. Why do they need God? Why do they need this one called Jesus? I mean, they're living in the here and now. They're not thinking about, well, what happens if I die tonight? They don't think that way. So they're right, in a way. My life is just fine. I don't need religion. What do I want that for? That's like... That's going to be depressing. If I go to church, they're going to want my money. Then I won't be able to go to the ball game on Sunday or whatever. Uh, so it's, it's just a cycle that mega churches have found a way around. Let me continue. Number nine, Christians live on some other planet than I do. These people are like, they believe in, you know, fairy tales. Like I used to believe in Santa Claus. They believe in this Jesus. And that he came to the earth, he died, and he died for their sins and he, only he can forgive sins, and, and that's what they're pushing. They're from another planet. I'm not from that. I don't believe that stuff. Uh, they believe that the Bible is an inspired word of God. And most people say, I don't believe that it's the inspired word of God. I mean, it was written by men, so obviously it's full of mistakes, like I said last week. So I don't believe them there. Number 10, I do not have time to go to church. I do have time to go to the Patriots game, or football, or what a Panthers, whatever, which is three hours. I can go to the movie on Friday night, that's a couple of hours, but church for an hour, no, I don't have time. So, I'm, but I get it. It's like, what, I gotta get up early Sunday? Come on, that's my day of rest. Even God had a day of rest. So that's why a lot of people don't go to church too. This commitment, I added a couple here. Number 11, the commitment. I don't want to go to church because once I go to church, then I got to commit to keep going to church. Then people are going to say, hey, I missed you because you missed last week. Then if I go too much 
every Sunday to church, they're going to want me to drive a bus and pick up little kids from a neighborhood. Or they're going to want me to teach Sunday school. They're going to want me to do something. I don't want to be committed to that stuff. I'm not going to church. That's why they like mega churches. They can sit way back there in the 10,000 seat and not even be noticed. But I digress. Number 12 and the final one here, why people don't go to church is this. If I go, well, I, I covered that already, I guess. They're going to put me to work, but they're going to make me do it for free. They don't pay their workers. They, you know, give me a volunteer. What? Yeah, you too. You're going to teach. You're going to drive the bus. You're going to sweep the floor. You're going to be the janitor on Sunday. You're going to usher in cars from the parking lot. I don't want to do that, so I'm not going to church. Okay. Now, why people do go to church? Very, very small reason. This is according to the Gallup poll. Let me read it to you. People go to church because it serves their need to socialize with others in their community or to make business contacts. Ooh, yeah, I mean, I, can, I sell real estate for a living. I do. So the reason I go to church is, you know, I might grab a, yeah, somebody's going to sell the house and I'll find out about it first. And they'll figure, hey, John goes to church. John, will you sell my house? Yeah. So I can make 12,000 bucks going to church. Yeah, that's why I go. <clears throat> or to maintain some sort of social status in their community. Hey, I'm a church goer. Hey, the guy at the hardware store, he goes to church too. He's a church goer. I'm a church goer. That must mean he's religious, and that must mean I'm religious, so hey, I got a little status thing going on here in the community. That's the only reasons people go to church, and there's a little tiny add-on here. In some cases, according to sociologists, and I'm reading this, it is a rational response of humans who feel the need to worship a real and powerful God. But if you go to church just to worship, how do you worship? What is worship? You know, and if you go in there to worship, why then do you sit back at the back of the auditorium saying, you know, I don't like that song. You know, they're getting too fancy around here. You know, the preacher's driving a big Cadillac. Are you really there to worship God or are you just there because, you know, out of guilt? There's another reason I just came to my that just came to my head. If I don't go to church, you know, I don't know what people are going to say, you know, they, you know, I went a couple times, I don't want to disappoint anybody. What a, so there are a few reasons, there are many reasons why people do not go to church, and only very few. But let me say this, out of the whole pile, all of them are wrong reasons to go to church. Let's find out what the right reason is. There's something missing in every one of those reasons. There's no mention of the name of Jesus anywhere. In the mega churches, they use Jesus like that guy did today on TV, saying, uh, you know, Jesus uh, was uh, looking up in the tree and there was Zacchaeus, and uh, you know, Zacchaeus, uh, you found salvation because now you're not thinking about your money, but uh, when we pass the plate, I don't want you people out there thinking about your money either. But they did mention the name Jesus. Mostly churches, like TV churches, mega churches, they'll talk about God a hundred times before they mention the name Jesus. That's really not what Jesus himself said that we should be doing in a local church. So, the types of churches I've already pointed out, they're small ones. You know, the little church with 28, uh, out in Lakeville, Mass, for example, or... Uh, Small, you know, a couple of hundred people, two or three hundred, that's small. Charles Stanley has a place in Virginia there. He's got the choir, he's got the organ and the piano. Uh, he's got uh, maybe the crosses there somewhere. He's got a Christian flag and an American flag, this is cool. And I, and I don't mean to demean his church in any way, shape, or manner. But he's not modern, he's not what they call a postmodern church. He's not what they call an emerging church, you know, a church that's with the program, a church that has figured out why people don't go and created ways to make people want to go. And I'll get into that in just a minute. But Charles Stanley's church, maybe he has a thousand people there, you know, maybe. So that's like a medium church. And then the mega churches, uh, Rick Warren's Saddleback Church out in uh, Lake Forest, California's one, Willow Creek Community 
church. Notice the word community. See, none of them are uh, like Saddleback Baptist Church. No, Saddleback Church, non-denominational. We're open. We're not exclusive. We're inclusive. We want to include everybody to come to the church. And that's cool. Jesus will do the same thing. Don't get me wrong. I love the word community church myself. But they want to disassociate themselves from specific functions like Lakewood Baptist Church. No, it's Lakewood Church, Joel Austin, down in Houston, Texas. So there's just three mega churches. A mega church would have maybe 10,000 or more people in it. They call a mega church 3,000 and up. But those churches are really huge. I think uh, Rick Warren boasts of, boasts of having 20,000 members or 40 or 60,000. You know, it's huge. And some of them, you look down, it looks like a football stadium full of people. Uh, all the mega churches have one thing in common that I have discovered. Church growth. When I say growth, I'm talking about growing numbers, people. We want to we want to do stuff to bring in people. And here's why. Um, here's Joel Osteen's goal. <coughs> Excuse me. Taken right off his own website. There is a new generation rising in Lakewood Church, a generation who does not believe in limits and who believes that all things are possible. See, this is that Robert Shula thing. You know, positive power of positive thinking stuff. Pastor Joel Osteen and his wife Victoria are leading the generation, the younger groups, with a practical message that is transforming lives. It's a message of hope, of healing. His wife was healed of cancer of forgiveness, a message that you can live the abundant life with God here and now, and God is calling you to that abundant life. I'm going to show you how to tap into the abundant life. I'm going to show you how to make you feel good about you. I am going to give you everything you want. That's what mega churches are all about. I'm going to, I am delivering, Joel Osteen still talking, I'm delivering a message that you can discover the champion in you. Hey, who doesn't want to be a champion? So the mega churches have learned through a guy named Peter Drucker, that is Rick uh, Warren, his guru was Peter Drucker, and uh, so was uh, Bill Hybels, and Joel Osteen, I don't know who his mentor was. He was a, he was a TV producer, and his father ran the church in uh, Lakewood Church in Houston until he died, I think it was 1999. Then Joel took it over and he used his media savvy, you know, the jumbotrons and the big screens and the, telev the televised services out to a hundred different countries uh, across the world. I mean, he exploded this thing and combined church stuff with media stuff. But Peter Drucker was a m into mysticism. I'll get into that in a minute. But he was basically combining, uh, making a mega church, combining that with business savvy. So the more people you get into your church, the more what? Moolah you can get, right? And the more good stuff you can do. Follow along with me. Every mega church appeals to the basic human need of belonging and achieving. Well, I'm lonely, I'm a widow, uh, my husband died, and I, want, I don't feel like I belong. I mean, uh, I'm in this, like, crappy old-age housing. And so if I can get out to Sunday, hey, church, we'll pick you up. But they have a senior citizens group. They, have, they meet everybody's needs for this ability to belong to some group. They have what they call small groups in a mega church. What? You're divorced? Not a problem. We got a divorce group. What? You're broke? We got a financial, we'll fix your finances group. We got everything. You got kids? Wow. Well, you see what we do for your kids. And I'll continue on. So they appeal to belonging and achieving. A basic philosophical, emotional need that every human being on the planet needs to sustain life, or so they think. Um, all of the above mega churches. Um, Saddleback, uh, Willow Creek, and then Lakewood Church in Houston, uh, build their churches on the two things, people's need for community, belonging, and enriching their own personal lives by learning how to become better people. 
Like I said, who does not desire to have at least those two things? Don't you want to feel good about yourself? Sure you do. Uh, <clears throat> Rick Warren and Bill Hybels follow the principles taught by Peter Drucker. I'll throw his face up there. I think he died in 2005, and he was a... Uh, Peter Ferdinand Drucker was an Austrian-born American management consultant, an educator, an author of, I don't know, 39 books or so, whose writings contributed to the philosophical and practical foundations of the modern business corporation. It goes on to say, Peter Drucker was a writer, a professor, a management consultant, and a self-described social ecologist who explored the way human beings organize themselves and interact much the way as an ecologist would observe and analyze the biological world. You know, so he studied people. Uh, what makes them function? Why don't they go to church? What can I do to make church into a business? And then he said, uh, he said, all of this can be done by creating mega churches. Was he a born again Christian? Absolutely not. But he had these ideas in uh, Rick Warren and the, uh, Bill Hybels. That was their guru. They learned from this guy how to merge philosophy and business and create this mega church situation. Um, let me go to this, what a social ecologist really is. Social ecologists blame economic, ethnic, cultural, and gender conflicts, you know, men against women, women's rights, uh, abortion rights, uh, gay rights, all this stuff. This is a conflict, right? Some are for it, some are against it. Social ecologists blame all the problems in the world, the ethnic, cultural, and gender conflicts, on the way society, that is people, have been brought up or trained. They prefer that all people come become equal. We call it, I call that progressivism, which is what President Obama is. Uh, and Hillary Clinton, and Bill Clinton, and a few other people. But progressives and social ecologists believe that in, you've heard it, uh, redistribution of wealth. If everybody's equal on the planet, then we can fix these social problems. That's what they are, social fixers of problems, so they think. So if the poor were, you know, wealthier, you tax the rich, take some of their dough, give it to the poor, then we won't have these social if issues. We won't have poverty, we won't have this, we won't have that. So that's their goal in any event. They call it, and I call it, social justice. Because there's so many injustices in the world. There's poor people in Africa, they're starving. What are we going to do? Come on, church. Let's, this is what they do, too, to make people feel good. We'll donate food. That's a great thing, it's commendable. We'll donate, we'll build wells in Africa, which they're doing, my church is even into that stuff, or Haiti. Um, we'll do this nice stuff for people, and uh, it sort of balances things out, this social injustices. So that's partly the goal of the mega churches as well. Now, I said that Peter Drucker was a mystic. Uh, he believed in mysticism. And mysticism is abiding by a set of principles or disciplines, I should say, in an effort to, re, re, uh, to achieve a relationship with God. In other words, if I go by and live by a certain set of disciplines, I gotta do this, I gotta get up in the morning and say my prayer, I gotta go do that, I gotta do that. If I do all that stuff, I can achieve a relationship with God. God says to his son Jesus in John 14, 6, there's only one way you're gonna develop a relationship with my Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. But none of these mega churches mention that. They never mention that. It's do good, do good stuff, come to our church, feel good, be a part of a huge family. You know, this, we're not losers. Look, we got 10,000 people here. One guy stood up last week and he said, we got we had 2,200 people here Sunday and we baptized 600 last week. Well, I'll cover that in just a minute. Uh, mysticism is based on feelings and emotions. This is what they're trained to do. Get a hold of your feelings. I want to feel good, because I don't feel good by myself, so they're going to help me feel good about myself. They'll get me in the church. Um, 
they're going to take some of my money away, they're going to do good stuff, and I'm going to feel good about that. They're going to teach me Bible stuff, Old Testament, whatever, and they're going to apply principles. Generally speaking, they do, but they don't, they, they avoid teaching doctrine. They avoid doctrine completely, or almost completely. Let me get to it. Uh, feelings and emotion and mysticism. It gives people a sense of unity and totality. I'm a total human being. I have unity. I'm, I'm united with my brethren. So, <coughs> boy. A sense of timelessness. When you're doing mysticism, which means if you're following these set of disciplines, uh, think about, and they tell you, think about one word between you and God and just meditate on that for 20 minutes. Uh, just you and God and just think that's going to bring you closer to God. Jesus says there's no way to get to God unless you go through me, remember? But they're teaching different things that other than biblical doctrine. It gives people a sense of having encountered ultimate reality. Wow. What they're doing is making many gods within themselves because they're creating a god who they believe uh, thinks like they do. And God doesn't. The Bible says God's ways are far superior and way above our ways. But they create their own little God. So if God views me as, you know, a nice person, I'm good. I'm going to heaven. Hey, I'm doing good stuff. I'm shelling out the dough for the wells in Africa or the poor people over there in Zambodia, uh, Cambodia, whatever. Uh, then I feel good about myself. So I'm creating a God who loves me because I'm doing stuff. Uh, he loves me because of my good works. A sense that one cannot adequately describe the richness of this experience of mysticism. That's what they're doing, combining mysticism and business with religion and quoting some parts of the Bible to make it all look good. Uh, Jesus said, as I say, John 14, 6, look it up yourself. There's one way to the Father, that's through me, because he died on the cross for your sins. Uh, the mega churches strive to get their people involved in social injustice repair, like I said, by creating these projects. Every church I've been into in the past probably two years, they, they all have a project. It used to be a missions thing where missionaries would go and preach the gospel to a lost and dying world in Indonesia or whatever. Now, the missionary projects are to go and help rebuild houses for, you know, the poor people in, in Maine. <clears throat> or um, to go put wells in where they don't have any in Africa and, uh, you know, socialize with the kids over there and make them think everything is cool. But it used to be they would go by the Bible, which is, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel and teach all nations what's in the book. They don't, that's not what they're doing now. Whether it's a small church, medium church, or mega church, it seems that missions outreach is totally different. It's to make you feel good and you're feeling part of this thing. Now, each mega, uh, Jesus said in Colossians 2, 8, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world. In other words, let's do what the world is doing. Let's bring in entertainment. Let's bring in the band. Not that I have anything against it. I don't. But let's bring in the big bands. Let's throw the jumbo trons up there. Uh, what's his name there? Joel Osteen is bringing in the British singer. Jeez, I can't remember her name, but it'll come to me in a minute. Um, but it's an entertainment value. It's like, wow, I got to go hear her. She was the one that was on American Idol, and they, they were shocked by her voice. Susan Boyd, that's her name. Uh, she's coming to their church pretty soon. Whoa, I gotta go. I mean, I can't miss that. So more people come in. Hey, Susan Boyd was at my church this week. Yeah? Good. And then they invite other people to come and be entertained. I'll get to that. Each of the mega churches mentioned declare on their websites, by the way, I checked them out, that salvation comes only through Jesus and what he did on the cross to save their soul. And their statements are perfectly perfectly in line with biblical principles. Um, baptism, they teach uh, about the Lord's Supper, 
uh, those kind of sacraments. So in writing on their websites, they cover themselves. Yeah, Jesus is the only way to get into heaven. Salvation, blah, blah, blah. Nobody ever reads that. They go to the church, though, where Jesus is mentioned one time out of a hundred or, or less than that even. What they don't emphasize is doctrine. Doctrine. What is doctrine? Biblical doctrine that Jesus taught and wanted preachers to teach is all about Jesus, the Son of God. That's a doctrine. They don't teach Jesus, the Son of God. They don't teach the blood that he shed uh, for the remission of sins. The Bible says, for without the remission of sins, there is no forgiveness of sins. And the only way you can get your sins forgiven is recognize that Jesus shed his blood on the cross, which they also don't teach. They don't teach the cross. The cross is cruel. There's Jesus up there nailed in his wrists and in his feet to die and suffer a horrible death for your sins of men. You don't hear that because why? It's negative. Nobody wants to hear that out there. So we don't teach it in the mega churches. They don't teach the cross. They don't teach salvation. They don't teach that people need to, need to have a savior. And why? They don't teach prophecy. None of them. Not even though the church that I was going to, which is a so-called postmodern church or emerging church, they emulate and copy what Rick Warren's feeding them. You know, they, they sell these churches programs. Uh, but nonetheless, they follow that doctrine. We don't teach prophecy because, you know, back in the past, so many people talk about, all oh, the coming of Christ. But without preaching the coming of Christ, or the building like I do, of that temple that's coming on Mount Zion, and people see the temple coming, if they don't know what that means, that Jesus says, when that's built, it will be desecrated. When it's desecrated, look up, Luke 21, for the Son of Man will be coming in the clouds. Well, if he's coming, then it's too late for you to repent. It's too late for you to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's all too late. So the old devil is the one who loves this stuff. He loves this mega church thing. He loves philosophy. Teach him anything, preach anything you want, take the money, spend it, do good, build wells, Feed the poor, do all that stuff, it's good, everybody's going to feel great, but nobody's getting saved. That's the problem. I will enhance that in just a minute. So they use some of the things that Jesus did, you know, like feeding the poor. Well, John, you're trying to tell me you're not supposed to feed the poor? Of course you are. But they emphasize the things that Jesus did that they want to amplify uh, social justice stuff. Well, feed the poor. Well, how did he feed the poor? Jesus did it through miracle. The churches back in the day, <coughs> like the first church, they would sell some of their stuff or, or bring food in and bring money into the church to go help the poor and the needy and the widows and the orphans and the homeless. They helped them. And then we all got away from that. So then the government stepped in and they feed the poor, which means you do too because you're paying it in your taxes. So these mega churches raise money to fix the social injustices of the world. And you're helping them to do it. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. What I'm saying is they emphasize the do good and the good works and they de-emphasize church doctrine, the cross, the blood of Christ, hell, heaven. Uh, they don't preach that stuff anymore. No way. Charles Stanley sure does. At the end of every one of his messages, he puts out a call. Uh, he invokes a call. If any of you have not received Christ as Savior, come on down the front, talk to me or any one of the pastors here or whatever, and we'll lead you to the Lord. That's a great thing. That's what Jesus really wants done. Okay, here's something from, uh, well, before I go there, the more money the mega churches takes in, the more social injustices they can cure and fix with your money. And you're feeling good about it. You feel good? You must have a ticket to heaven, right? They don't preach salvation or anything else. I'm going to prove that to you in just a minute. From CNN, they're talking about the Lakewood Church, Joel Austin. Uh, from CNN, the Lakewood Church, which Austin is in charge of, has a yearly budget of more than 800, no, $80 million a year. 
80 million bucks, one church. 80 million dollars they take in. I don't know if that's a lot of money, but they say that mega churches take in billions of dollars every year. What do they do with that? Well, they ride around in fancy cars. They, some of them have three exotic houses, usually on the ocean. One of them flies a charter jet over to Hawaii with a group of his golfing buddies. I'm going to not name names, <clears throat> but I'm saying they take real good care of themselves, sort of like Congress does, and we're paying. In any event, billions go into these churches and they take care of the social injustices of the world. That's not all bad, don't get me wrong, it's not all bad. If they could just get the doctrines of the Bible coupled with what they're doing for good works out there, they'd have a winner. I mean, they got numbers, not a problem, they got people. But Jesus is worried about, not worried about, well, yeah, he wants people to be saved and trust him as their Lord and Savior and trust him for their every need, and nobody's teaching them how to do that. You got, you got a tithe. I'm telling you, it drives me nuts. Let me continue. Uh, mega churches have succeeded in mastering the goal of giving people what they want. Entertainment. Susan Boyd, this is where I wrote it down, is coming to Lakewood. Doing good deeds, not being judgmental, like homophobic, and giving them a sense of belonging to a winning church, a huge mega church. Yet, for those who want to belong to those mega churches, look at them on TV yourself, or go to one, pick one. There's a few around here. They, may, they might have a couple of thousand people going to it, but go to them. And I've gone to them. Uh, there's one down in Rhode Island I went to a couple of times. Soon as the preacher, they got the band, they got the Megatrons up there, everybody's screaming and yelling and raising their hands, and they call that praising the Lord, and I'm not judgmental. I'm not saying they're not. Some of them believe they are. Some of them just do it to do it. Some of them get caught up in the music and yeah, yeah, let's rock it. And they're dancing and doing all kinds of stuff. Then he delivers a great message. I mean, beautiful message. Um, salvation's generally not in it. Then they end the message. Here you go with the social get together and the pastors of the mega churches. They beat it out the back door and you know, you. Have a good day. See you later. See you next week, you guys. They don't... The old day churches, the pastor used to go to the back of the church after he ended the, uh, his message and had somebody else pray while he went to the back of the church and he wanted to shake your hand. That's belonging. He's your minister. But yet these pastors of these mega churches, they're not really... They're a speaker. They're really good speakers too, believe me. You can't be a dope and, uh, and run a mega church. You've you got to be charismatic. But they're gone. The message is over. See you later. You know, maybe they have a fear of getting gunned down. I don't know. But they're gone. Uh, they downplay church doctrine. What is church doctrine? The word doctrine, according to the Bible, in the Greek, means the teachings that are found within the Bible. Old Testament and New. Uh, God's laws in the Old Testament, and then Jesus' commandments, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, which means my sayings, the things he told us to strive to do in the New Testament. <clears throat> they don't, a doctrine is the work that Jesus did on the cross. Doctrine is teaching that the lost people in this world are going to die and go into that place called hell unless they repent. I heard one preacher say, uh, if you want Jesus to come into your life, pray this prayer. Jesus, come into my life and save me. And then he says right after that, if you did, you now belong to the church of God. What happened to the repentance? Without repentance, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. Jesus said it. So that's a quick loop into the church. Hey, say this quickie prayer and you're done. You can say a quickie prayer, but repentance is part of that. Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve the lake of fire. But I trust you that you died on the cross for my sins and that you said that you would save me from that lake of fire if I trust you and ask you to become my Lord and Savior. That'll get you into heaven, my friend. The act of repenting, missing from these megachurches. The redemption that Jesus offered, 
Redemption means somebody paid for your sins so that you didn't have to go to hell. They don't preach that Jesus is your redeemer. He's the one that paid. He redeemed you, sort of like redeeming a bottle. He paid for it. He paid for your sins. But you've got to ask him to save you and repent. Then he issues forgiveness and righteousness. He trades you his righteousness so that you can then talk to God without a priest or all that other stuff in between. You can talk right to God because God sees you through the righteousness of His Son if you trust in Jesus as your Savior. Salvation. They don't teach it anymore. Saved from what? From hell. Saved to what? To heaven. They don't teach that anymore because hell, it's a bad place. Nobody wants to hear about that because it's going to remind them that they're sinners and they know that sin has to be punished. So they look at God like He's just a big whipping guy up there Hey, you committed a sin, that's it, boom. That's not who God is. God is not willing that any should perish, that, but that all should come to repentance and be saved and inherit the kingdom of God. That's what he wants for everybody. The promise of heaven, they don't teach that anymore. Uh, hell, like I say, why people go there? They go there because they're sinners and they need salvation. Baptism is an ordinance. They don't teach that. I mean, they do it every now and then, but they don't teach why people get baptized. They don't do the Lord's uh, Supper, which is, the Bible says, do this in remembrance of me, remembering that I died on the cross for your sins. Remember that my blood was shed for your sins. Remember that my body was broken for your sins. So therefore, the wine or grape juice, if you will, represents his blood. The bread represents his broken body. A lot of churches don't even do that anymore. Uh, Matthew 15, 9 says this, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines of the Bible the commandments of men. Whatever men come up with, they say, well, this is how you're going to reach salvation. You give, you build wells, you go to Haiti, you do good stuff, you come to church, you attend, you're worshiping God because you're listening to the music and raising your hands and all that. So, hey, you've got to take it to heaven. Uh, they just avoid teaching the doctrines. 2 Timothy 4, 3, and I'm wrapping this up pretty soon. For the time will come, Jesus said this, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. We're here, folks. Instead, to suit their own desires, their own needs, their own emotions to be fulfilled, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want them to say, what, homophobia, what, the Bible says that it's an abomination of God. You, you'll never hear a, a mega church preacher ever talk about homosexuality. No, it isn't going to happen because that would be not inclusive. That would be like exclusive. Um, they, they don't preach on it. So what do you think homosexuality is on the rise? Not only is it on the rise, it's law now. Because these people are teaching that, hey, it's all right. I know God said it's an abomination, but you know, you can't, you got to treat everybody equal. There's social injustices out there. We're here to fix them. <clears throat> Jesus said he wants to have a relationship, one-on-one -on -one relationship with you and with me. You don't have to have a relationship with bunch of people at church, although he commands us that we go to church for a different reason. Um, so, but he wants the relationship with you. All of that is circumvented in these mega churches and some small churches too. People want to hear, like he just said, things that suit their own desires, including being entertained and doing good works, neither of which can save their soul from that lake of fire. So, what kind of church should you be attending? Small, medium, large? Really doesn't matter, but there is a church that you should be attending. Uh, Hebrews 10, 23 through 29 says this. Now, we can look forward to the salvation that God has promised us. There is no longer any room for doubt, and we can tell others that salvation is ours, for there is no question that God will do what he says he will do. Jesus says, if they call upon me, they shall be saved. Uh, don't neglect the church, uh, going to church, because it says in the Bible, uh, 
no, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves as the manner, manner of some is. Come there, and the, you're in the church for to get taught first salvation, then sound doctrine about, okay, now you're saved. Now what? Jesus says, now that you're saved, I want my guys to teach you how to go out and win more souls to the kingdom of heaven. But they're not doing that. <clears throat> uh, Here's the first church in Jerusalem. So this is the type of church you should try to look for. In Acts chapter 2, especially around verse 42, it says this. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teachings were, and still are found in the New Testament, and they came from the teachings of Christ who taught them. So, all the believers devoted themselves to those doctrines and to fellowship one with another to encourage each other. They shared in meals. In other words, they had community, which is great, including the Lord's Supper, which was the do this in remembrance of me. And they committed themselves to prayer, praying for each one another. Uh, and that day, the, book, the Bible says in Acts 2, and that day, God added to this church such as should be saved. In other words, God could trust that church and he put growth into that church, and 3,000 souls were added to the new church in Jerusalem that very day. Why? Because they believed what the doctrine of the apostles and Jesus <clears throat> that was being taught to them was real. Um, churches are growing today. So is God putting the tens of thousands of people in those churches? They will tell you, yes. I'm telling you, no. I'm saying that the old devil loves that kind of stuff. Not that these people are of the devil. I don't believe they are. I think they, for the most part, are sincere. But they also want growth. They want numbers. One guy, as I said, Steve Furtado or something like that. Furtog. That's it. I got it right here. Uh, he's into this thing. Hey, we had 600 baptized last week. Well, uh, Jesus said this. I want you to go into all the world and preach, teach people my commandments. That's what's in the New Testament. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. So let it be, which means, he says, amen. That means, so let it be. Now, teaching what? Teaching men what? Sound doctrine. Uh, but they don't teach it. They teach social justice. Uh, so, let me go over to uh, another little area here. I, and i got to just end this, because i got three or four pages. I don't have the time to do it. <clears throat> if you find a church, small, medium, or large, where they're preaching out of this Bible, and they can use the jumbotrons, they can do, you know, the choir, or whatever it is that they're doing. But when the preacher stands up, he's supposed to... Uh, He's supposed to be teaching, let's see if I can find that. The cross, heaven and hell, the doctrines that I've already mentioned. But I wanted to point this out. I went to one of these emerging churches for months because I, I thought it was cool. I wanted to study it. And then I started to volunteer to do a few things like be an usher or, you know, special events guy. <clears throat> So I was there, and I was talking to another guy, a member who'd been there for six months. And uh, he said he was having marital problems with his wife. And I said, well, uh, I'll be praying with you and for you. He says, oh, well, uh, you know, God should take care of this thing because I go to church here. I've been going here for like six months. In other words, I'm doing my thing. I'm feeling good. I'm socializing. I'm paying out the money for the well over there in Haiti, which they support. And... Uh, and crops and jobs in Haiti for the Haitians. And I said, but do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? No, I, no, I, no, I don't, they don't teach that here. <clears throat> I then learned over time that they didn't. It was like, what, you're going to say a prayer of repentance and that's it, that gets you into heaven? And they minimized the thing. But they would emphasize social injustice issues. So I got out of there. 
Another church, uh, Bill Heibels, talking about that mega church in Illinois. Visited that church and I taped it. Glad I did. Because in there he said this. Mega church, 10,000, 20,000 people on a Sunday. Mega church. He gives these uh, summits, you know, <clears throat> worldwide summits where thousands and hundreds of thousands of people go. And all that's well and good. And he talks a good talk and he talks about, you know, the Bible and God and all the stuff that you want to hear. <clears throat> but here's the deal. He said, because this church was building, trying to build new additions, you know, to get the youth involved and the college kids and more people, more bodies, mega, mega, big, emerging church, postmodernism, which is to take stories out of the Bible and then they read books that some guy wrote about the stories in the Bible like uh, the prodigal son in Luke 15 and whatever the guy in the book said, they studied that rather than what the Bible said about it and they twisted that whole thing around and at the end of it they were saying God could be male or female. Jesus said, my Father, which is in heaven, he, I mean a million times, Father, is that a woman? Is that mom? No. Anyway, that's how screwed up they were, so that's why I got out of there. But this Bill Heibel guy, to get back to him, and he can't deny it because I heard it and taped it. But he said uh, that he bumped into a woman, talking about church growth, he says he bumped into a woman and he says, uh, so, what do you like about, uh, whatever the name of this church is, uh, Willow Creek. What do you like about Willow Creek? She says, well, I love almost everything about, about it, but especially, I love the nursery. I love how you did the nursery. You know, we get to see everything that's going on. It's just beautiful here. It's absolutely stunningly beautiful. Everything is nice. And he says, so, uh, how long... Uh, how long have you known Jesus as your Savior? She said, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. He said, how long have you been coming here? She said, two and a half years. Do you get my point? Mega church, preach this, social justice, feel good. It's called, like that Peter Zucker guy was into Zen. Um, he was into uh, pantheism, which means, you know, you're basically making, like I said before, God into a God that suits your purposes. So, but two and a half years, she wasn't saved. She felt good. She was in attendance every Sunday. She was pouring the money into the wells and doing all kinds of good stuff, feeding the poor overseas, uh, AIDS research, all that stuff. It was great. But she was on her way to hell. My point is, what is the point of having a mega church? without preaching the doctrine of the cross, hell, heaven, salvation, Christ, crucified, all that stuff. It's of no value whatsoever. The lady felt good, she felt good about herself, and she would feel good on her way into hell. And when she got to see God at the end of when the judgment period comes, he's going to say, why should I let you into heaven? Well, because I went to that church there and they told me, you know, do good, pay some money, they took care of the poor. I was doing the stuff. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It is by faith, faith in Christ, that we are saved and that we receive heaven as a free gift through repentance and salvation. It is not of works, good works, lest any man should boast. So that woman was on her way to hell. Still might be, because I don't know the woman. But if you're going to a church for two and a half years and they never had an altar call, what we call an altar call, or at least an invitation to say at the end of every service, if anybody here does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and you want to, because he's the only way you're going to get into heaven, come and see me, the preacher, or come and see one of our guys down the front here, or women, in case you're a woman, and they will pray with you and they will lead you to the Lord. If they did that, they could incorporate great things. Yo, I don't think the devil would go for that thing. So that is my point. Uh, so no matter how small, medium, or large your church is, if they don't preach the blood of the cross, the cross, salvation, the doctrines of Christ, then you are wasting your time in that church. I don't care how big it is, or I don't care how good you feel. Uh, 
you need to you need to get into a church that preaches from the Bible that preaches those things that I said that Jesus said must be preached and then their job is to teach you train you exhort you uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, and I'll close with this, because teach what would be the thing. Teach what, John? It says this, all scripture, that means all of the Bible, is given by inspiration of God, written by men, inspired by God, and it is profitable for all doctrine, that's the teachings of God and Jesus. For conviction, that means conviction by the Holy Spirit, who will talk to people and tell them why they need a Savior through a message, conviction for correction that means to restore one to a state of righteousness in other words to be right with God you need to have they need to teach you correction which is I'm going this way repentance brings you back this way toward correction toward righteousness and for instruction in righteousness what does that mean it means that righteousness is a condition of the spirit that is acceptable to God through integrity, virtue, purity of life, rightness with God, correctness of thinking, so you're not always thinking evil thoughts, uh, and of correctness of feeling and acting. In other words, purity of life. That's what the goal is. That's what they should be teaching you. Not all this flowers and stuff, and, and you know, let's uh, talk about Zacchaeus and how he changed his whole mind around and received salvation because his mind got off his money and on to, you know, things, uh, whatever, I don't know. But when they said his salvation came to him the moment he got his mind off his money, I knew where they were going and I clicked it off. So, Jesus said this, Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and might. Love your neighbor as yourself. Get into a church. Forsake not the assembling of yourself together as the manner of some is. And get into that local church. Get to know who Christ is. Develop a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus. Then you get to learn things out of the Bible that really is important. Why do you give money to the church? It's simple. Uh, God wants everything to be done from the heart. I want to do this. I want to do it because. Not because you feel good. Because it's the right thing to do, just like he just said. All right, so with that, I'm going to leave you because I've been blabbing way too long. But I had to talk about churches, small church, medium church, no church, mega church, why people go, why people don't go. And I'll see you next week. Uh, hopefully I won't have this chest cold by then. Thanks.